Well, I think in healthcare, it's a little bit different. I don't think everybody is willing to be told or to get their prognosis from a digital device, for example. And so, you know, one of the challenges there is changing the game. Um, changing the game, getting people to think differently about their health care and to think more proactively about their health care. And accordingly, we have to do the same. It is the duty of leaders to lead, of the creative to create, of the daring to do. The free world expects leadership of us. Its fate and our fate depends upon our leadership. We are industrious, inventive, restless, with the fires that burn within us. I say that nothing is easy, and the best things are the hardest. And all our troubles, all our immense difficulties, now and in the future, can I say, be solved if we have the will, the courage. Today, our esteemed guest is Terry Booker, the VP of Corporate Development and Innovation at Independence Blue Cross. Uh, Booker combines years of experience in investment banking and business development with an insider's knowledge of Independence Blue Cross, which is an insurer that serves more than, I, I, I've heard, 7 million people located in um, or headquartered in Philadelphia, PA. So, Terry, it is our pleasure to have you on this Fireside Chat. Thank you for taking the time with us today. Thank you for inviting me, Logan. Appreciate being here. Let's start just by hearing a bit of your story. I want to know how you got into health innovation. I mean, there are simpler ways that you can make money in uh, business development and in investment banking, the less complicated ways than getting into healthcare. So what, should, what got you into healthcare innovation? Sure. So um, about 11 years ago now, uh, Independence Blue Cross was standing up a corporate development area. And uh, I was brought in, I was a consultant at first, and then I was brought in in-house to actually uh, run the group. And then in 2014, Dan Hilferty, who was our CEO at the time, really took on an initiative along with a number of other people, Brian Lobley, Mike Venera, and a few others to really focus on innovation. So we had been investing uh, in a uh, indirect way through a number of funds, actually in our pension fund, not with a strategic mindset in place. And that year we decided, the board decided that we would invest $50 million, uh, 20 of that direct, 30 of that indirect, meaning that we would be with certain private equity and venture, uh, venture fund managers. And we're also a limited partner in the Blue Venture Funds. So we've been in all four of their funds thus far. And in that process, um, you know, we continue to look at companies and try to figure out the inorganic ways. And that's my group's uh, role to look at those inorganic things that might help us uh, in the delivery of healthcare and to be more efficient as it relates to the, us being that intermediary between the providers and the patients slash customers of healthcare. Um, so that's kind of what gets us to gets me to where I am today. Before I sort of move on, what do you mean by inorganic? Could you sort of drill down on that a little bit? Well, you know, organic stuff would, you know, for us would be uh, things that happen within the company. So there are lots of initiatives and efforts that happen within the company. So when we look at uh, working with vendors, any of the folks that are out there today, I see David Weingart out there. Uh, and so we've seen Cecilia any number, number of times. And so trying to connect those things to the mission that we have uh, for our customers. And in some cases, our customers, uh, is, it can be a Medicaid patient. It can be a duals patient. It can be a Medicare Advantage patient. Uh, but in many cases, and most of those members are commercial customers. So we have companies that uh, fund their benefits programs through us. And then we have individuals that are probably, whether they have an individual plan or whether they are a part of one of the government plans from the ACA that underwrite that. And so we're trying to figure out how to keep them all healthy and how to be proactive in the marketplace. Awesome. Well, we're going to get into the details of really how you partner with startups. But before we do that, paint us a picture of Independence Blue Cross. Kind of pull back the curtain, help us understand yeah. this payer. Sure. So Independence Blue Cross, and it's you'll see me, or well, you won't see me do it, but we have what are called the uh, FOC, the family of companies. So we've got about 25 to 30 companies, it depends on which week it is, uh, that we do business uh, literally all over the country. Uh, most notably, uh, we're Independence Blue Cross in 
uh, the five counties of southeastern Pennsylvania. Those are the five most populous counties in the state. Uh, we also do business with, uh, with a company called AmeriHealth Caritas, and that's in about 24 states across the country, and that's in Medicaid managed care. Um, and then thirdly, we take that AmeriHealth brand and we do business in New Jersey and a number of other places, uh, AmeriHealth New Jersey, and we have AmeriHealth Administrators, which is a third party administration firm. Um, essentially what we are is a $25 billion company. Uh, the margins, uh, as many of you know, in insurance are somewhat razor thin. However, in the last year, we've seen a bit better margins because of the pandemic and the fact that ML, you know, people couldn't get to or go to hospitals. So our uh, medical loss ratio was a good bit less. And so that's where, you know, telemedicine exploded and a number of other things. And so uh, while we didn't have the same surgery cost that we would have in any given year, we did have a lot more telemedicine charges. And, you know, what we had to do then is really adapt to that digital aspect uh, of the market. And I'll say to you, probably before the pandemic, you know, we had some incredibly small portion of people that were getting telemedicine visits. And so we had to change a lot of policy uh, to make sure that doctors could in fact uh, care for folks via a digital experience. Could you break that down for us a little bit more? Uh, what did that adaptation look like? That's a major movement for such wow. a large organization. Yeah, so it, it is. So for example, for IBC, we have, you know, we, we base a lot of our care off of primary care physicians or PCPs. And so as a part of a person's PCP visit, we would normally uh, uh, anticipate and, and expect that a phone call back to that physician uh, would in fact be covered within that, that visit, as opposed to now each and every incidence of that digital experience is a claim. You know, it's a telemedicine claim, whereas before uh, we were having challenges kind of make, with our own practice, making that uh, an acceptable process. So we had to change a lot of policies uh, and, and, and claims rules within our system to allow folks to really uh, focus on having telemedicine visits and uh, whether it be behavioral health or actual you know, tele, telederm visits, you name it, uh, we now cover that. What did that process teach you about the culture of innovation within your organization? This idea that sort of your ability to change and, and how you change can be as important as that particular change in the moment? Well, you know, I think, you know, to be frank, Logan, I, I think we are always fast followers. Um, you know, it's, it's fairly complicated as it relates to systems to change uh, claims rules and things like that. So when you're changing one, you have to change it across a number of platforms for employers and for all kinds of folks. Um, and as you can imagine, each employer, each program, uh, each governmental uh, program all have different rules. And so we tend not to get out in front of those rules. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But I think, all, you know, otherwise, um, we do see how those things, uh, so, I mean, clearly we've all seen telemedicine for a while, even the folks from Tele Teledoc and Livongo and many other people that you've probably seen out there had been to the company um, and <clears throat> some of the things that we do happen through the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. So as a part of that process, uh, because we have to be able to uh, cover members that happen to be across the country, not just in Philadelphia Metro, um, a lot of that process gets approved at the association level. So for example, uh, one of the companies that we deal with there is MD Live and it's not Teladoc. And there are many others that are out there that are, I think, equally as good, but we end up having that selected uh, through our association. Hopefully that's uh, an answer to your question. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that, that helps. I mean, you have to balance this culture of innovation. I was just gonna ask, you know, how does such a large company uh, think through the risk, the risk taking that's necessary uh, to be innovative? I mean, here you are in an innovation um, position and you have to balance this um, uh, caution versus risk sort of sure. scenario. How, well, how do you do that? Well, I think in healthcare, it's a little bit different. I don't think everybody is willing to be told or to get their prognosis from a digital device, for example. And so some of the things are really more methodological in terms of when can you see a doctor or how can you see a doctor? How can you have better access to a nutritionist? How can you do more proactive things 
when in fact, for many, many years, even decades, we've been much more reactive about our health. You know, we don't, we typically don't go to the doctor when we're healthy to say, how do we, how do you make us better? We typically go to the doctor when something's wrong. And so I think, you know, in many cases, people look to remediate that. And so, you know, one of the challenges there is changing the game. Um, changing the game, getting people to think differently about their health care and to think more proactively about their health care. And accordingly, we have to do the same. Uh, mm. But there's still tons and tons of people that will still, you know, go to the doctor when they're sick. And so, you know, part of that is, you know, that innovation culture, we see from a very, um, like a 10,000 foot view, what's happening. And the question is, how do you get that to change? Because, you um, I think that there are lots of things that existed and let's just focus on telemedicine, for example. I mean, telemedicine has been around for a long time. Um, we've had it for many of our customers for a long time. It just hasn't been something that was used until it was absolutely necessary that people used it that way. You know, so I think at some point each individual has to figure out what the utilization is for them. I mean, you see, you know, uh, you know, what is it? Paypax that does the uh, prescriptions uh, online prescriptions in a package. I mean, for that person who doesn't feel like putting pills in a pill box, that seems like the 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 order. So it all depends on the customer, and not you know not yeah. just the doctor, not just the provider. Yeah, and clearly you're using your investment in uh, health innovation companies as a way to kind of push forward. You mentioned a fifty million dollar fund. I think that sort of kicked off this innovation sure. side of the business, right? Let's get into the more details of kind of how you spend that money, kind of. Uh, we can talk about kind of who you've invested in, but I think question number one, uh, what are some of the business model trends that you are most excited about in terms of how you invest those funds? Well, I think, you know, I think the ones that put, you know, more, uh, you know, are better tools for providers. I think, you know, customers will be all over the place in terms of their desire and ability to utilize some of uh, some of the things that are out there that are innovative. Um, and, you know, we do, a, you know, we do a good bit for a number of years. We were a sponsor along with Penn Medicine uh, in the Dream at Health Accelerator. So there were, I don't know, in the, in the neighborhood of somewhere between 60 and 100 companies we, we saw, you know, through that program and, and, and did a lot of work with. Um, you know, but I think uh, when you look at it, uh, fee for value is huge. And while it's not, you know, across the whole market, and I think a lot of that still happens within the scheme of large academic medical centers and large IDNs who may have ulterior motives uh, in terms of wanting to do the most efficient thing and the, and the best thing and the most innovative thing at the time. I mean, all of these folks have very complicated infrastructures um, that are not easy to change. Uh, and so I think, you know, I think we'd like to move faster, uh, but there are a lot of people you got to get to go along. Yeah, yeah. I, I find that first comment you made is interesting, really focusing on the provider experience. You said kind of with the assumption that the uh, consumer attitudes are kind of going to kind of be all over the place. I wonder if you could speak to that. I'm sure there's folks on this call that are thinking through the different uh, user bases uh, of their product and you talk, speak to the value of really um, understanding that provider user base? Well, I think the provider user base, it, again, it depends. I mean, if we feel that most of the activity, uh, most of a person's uh, health activity should be directed by uh, a, a primary care physician and having someone to navigate you through the healthcare ecosystem, you know, because as you've seen, you know, uh, a, a doctor at one hospital, a specialist at one hospital can be dramatically more or less expensive than a specialist at another hospital. And similarly, they may have different outcomes. And so um, having those tools available at the very ground level, you know, with each PCP is really difficult because some of them, you know, are just uh, doing meaningful use digital EMRs and things like that. So they might not know about you know, all of the things that I see on a daily basis. And, and quite frankly, uh, when you look at somebody going to a teledoc or any telemedicine venue, uh, one of the things that had to happen for many of these independent physicians is for them to be able to offer those services and not have to kind of push them off to some other entity like 
you know, I'm just using Teladoc just because it's an easy name to use everybody. Sure. Um, but um, what that what that doctor would like to do is that doctor would like to have that appointment him or herself, because when you go to somebody else, they don't get that fee for service, you know, that fee for service revenue. And so many of the independent physicians are still fee for service rev, uh, physicians, and that's how they get paid. Uh, oh, yeah. And so you have to kind of, you know, look at all these things and say, well, how do we, you know, provide those same tools so that we can provide a high level of efficiency and a high level of outcomes to each and every patient, not just some patients who have to be, who happen to be, you know, their doctor happens to be with the large uh, AMC or IDN. I'm assuming that you look at a lot of startups, a lot of health innovation companies, you have to sort of spot these trends, uh, assuming that a cohort of them kind of fall into the right top level themes that you've just mentioned. What are some, some of the secondary traits that you find yourself looking for, whether it's in the executive team, whether it's in the business model, how the team thinks, et cetera? Um, I think, you know, for me, you know, the first question I ask is who's going to pay for this? Um, you know, so whether it's somebody like us as an insurer, um, one of the things that you always have to think about with an insurance company, at least in Pennsylvania, is that there's no corporate practice of medicine. So we stop just short of the line of telling uh, one of our members exactly what to do. We will say, you should call the doctor. We just won't call the doctor for you. And so, um, you know, so kind of breaching that gap. I mean, that's a legal issue for us, um, you know, but breaching that gap. And so when you look at the folks uh, on the provider side, you know, again, uh, how is that person going to integrate with your service? So let's just say um, that you're, at, you're on palliative care. You know, how does that doctor hand off that patient to a palliative care physician uh, at those later stages of that person's life? So those handoffs there, and there are many of them in healthcare, uh, you know, in terms of how do you handle those and how do you make sure that people are being handled, handed off to the right person? How do you make sure that each patient has some visibility about what's going to happen to them or what about what can happen to them? And likewise, once they have that visibility, is there somebody that can say that can navigate them? You know, do this, not that. This is going to be shorter. This is going to eliminate some of your frustration. I think we all have a lot of that. Yeah. I mean, one thing I'm hearing in your answer is that a startup startup needs to think through the full care journey, the patient journey, and not just have their sort of micro view of their problem. And we get a lot of folks who do have the micro view that, hey, this is a $10 billion area. And often it might be a $10 billion area, but we just don't see it that way because it's a part of an overall process mm -hmm. that may have begun 10 steps before. So we can't pull that process out. Some other participant in, the, you know, the only, the only way that we pull it out is unfortunately by either approving a claim or denying a claim. And that's the good. fact is, is that, you know, that member should know whether that's a part of their benefit design as they go through the process. So we should go through a lot more, a lot fewer denied claims from a, you know, just from a customer service and a net promoter score perspective than people kind of doing things and then finding out it's not being paid for or that they went to an out of network doctor. All of these things that I know as just a person who's in the industry, most people don't know. And it's a, it's a tremendous source of abrasion and frustration. Got it. That makes sense. Uh, I know a lot of folks on this call are sort of working on on validation and understanding what kind of validation is going to be helpful for individual partners. So I wonder if you could give any wisdom around sort of the health economic data um, that stands out to you as sort of necessary lines in the sand. I mean, you, you, you could be talking about FDA uh, clearance and where you're on in that pipeline. You could be talking about sort of the size of the trials that you've done. What are, some, are there some numbers that you sort of think about and that stick out to you? Um, Logan, actually, no. I mean, for, for certain things like, um, you know, there was a, a product that we looked at a couple of years ago that uh, basically it was like an airbag for, for the elderly that if they fell over, it, it had, uh, you know, whatever's in an iPhone that says, uh oh, you're falling. We need to kind of put off this airbag to keep people from injuring their hips. Okay, but something like that needs FDA approval. Um, you know, a lot of the things that are out there today in terms of 
applications for, uh, you know, for smartphone use, et cetera, you know, really need some FDA approval. So, you know, that's on one side. Um, you know, the trials actually don't need, you know, tons and tons of numbers for services. I think part of it is really to, you know, again, think through that continuum and say, well, how can I partner up with, you know, a PCP? And, and some of this stuff doesn't happen over a month long period. It probably happens over six months to a year. And you say, uh, I think somebody asked the question uh, about diabetes and a bunch of other things. Well, you know, A, that you can evaluate that person. B, you can uh, suggest to that person that they engage in, you know, uh, a diabetes management service or a tool or whatever. And then do they stick to it? Does it actually allow them to lower their A1C? And, you know, do they then kind of measure that outcome and so on? Um, you know, so, you know, those are the things that ha have to happen and they don't happen quickly. And often uh, what ends up happening is folks come to us and say, don't you have a population that you want to do this with? And the answer is probably, but you know, we, that's a lot of work for us to do. And so that might not be the priority issue. So you may spend some time waiting, unfortunately. Um, you know, what comes to my mind just to sort of seed the insight uh, period is just your comments about, the feedback loop. You talked about a positive collaboration with a payer really needing to have an understanding of uh, how is this changing the dynamic for my partner and not just sort of hyper focused on um, on your own product and your own product journey, but understanding the full patient journey, uh, understanding the sort of pain points that that your collaborator is working through. And, yeah. and, and Logan, to, you know, to you know, I think that 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 is there. You know, just the, you know, often we have companies come in, um, you know, we, we had a couple of the uh, large pharma companies come in and talk about patient journeys for cancer, let's say. And some of that stuff is just, it's really a journey of where you will intervene with certain tools. So the journey shouldn't be so much different based on whether I'm taking a Bristol Myers product or whether I'm taking a Forest Lab product or whomever, you know, so it should really, and you know, it, it should really avail me of the best, uh, the best uh, brain power available at that particular time, and it should also be sensitive. And so, you know, often I find that folks haven't mapped that out. I mean, literally a pictorial map to say, well, this is what we understand the patient journey to be, and so at some point we could say, oh no, that part right there, step three doesn't actually occur or a step three should be step eight. Um, and so that helps to kind of at least create a good foundation for us collectively evaluating that problem or that product uh, that an entity you know, has. I think, um, you know, what I've seen is, you know, you know I, I don't know, and this is, this is where I get a bit provocative. You know, I don't know that each day a person wakes up and really you know, cares about their health in the way that we think they do. I think they care about their ability to remediate that health. Okay. And so they look to our insurance to help do that. But do we all do the things that we're supposed to do to stay healthy? And it's not until those things, something happens, you know, your, your, your liver feels a certain way, you feel sluggish because of your diet, or you've been to the hospital a few times because you've been hypo or hyperglycemic. Um, you know, those are the things that you have to say, really, I want to be, I really want to live a great life and I'm going to do these things. How can we, because it's cheaper for us to do it as well, how can we help you do that? You know, I mean, we're not at that place yet. We're still at people kind of saying, uh, I feel really horrible today. What is it? Oh, I have some chronic disease. And they, you know, you, you find out that and then you have to, you know, yeah. uh, de determine, are you going to take the steps to remediate that? And a lot of that is personal. And understanding that psyche is critical to being a problem solver. If you don't really understand where the patient's head is at, um, you can't build the solution for it. Uh, we're getting close to the top and I want to ask you one last question. Here you've got a, a panel of about three dozen founders from distinct health innovation companies. Uh, you've got a chance to give them uh, one, a parting shot, a parting piece of advice about um, their work and sort of their journey. What would you say to them? I would say, hey, understand who's going to pay for your product or service. I mean, a lot of people think they say, oh, well, you're going to pay for it. And I was like, no, I'm not. Um, so, you know, there's that element. But I think also to really understand where where you sit in the patient journey in terms of a decision and 
if you've got an idea of what that outcome could look like or a way that you have been measuring the outcome, um, to be able to share that, I think will also kind of raise eyebrows and say, oh, well, maybe we should look more closely at this. Um, you know, so I, I see a lot less of the patient journey and a lot more of, hey, let's go to the big insurer because that big insurer represents 7 million members. And so, you know, let's start there as opposed to lobbying one you know, on a one-off basis, the 7 million members. I mean, you know, there are other things, you, you know, if you know of a good physician IPA, maybe, you know, those are people who too, who would say, hey, we should use your service for all of our patients. Um, you know, one, I just read a news article, you know, one just started in the, in the suburban counties of, of Philadelphia. So um, there are subgroups that you can target as well, not just the insurer. And uh, you can probably look at entities, like if any of you or many of you haven't reached out to somebody like Roy Rosen at Penn, you know, at Penn Innovation, or, you know, I can't remember who's at Temple these days. Um, and uh, I think, uh, uh, I had to think of who's at Jefferson in that role. Um, but, you know, I think those are all good places to start as well as us. Awesome. Well, that takes us to the top of the hour. Wise words, Terry. We are privileged to have you uh, as a part of this fireside chat. We, I speak for everybody when I say thank you for taking the time from your vacation uh, in Martha's Vineyard, taking a little time away and uh, joining us and really pulling back the curtain on, on how Independence Blue Cross thinks about innovation and how startups can collaborate with uh, big payers. So thank you.